I'm being critiqued. Which part? Um, People making a, um, cartoons about it? No, those are good. Those are good. That, that's fantastic. I mean, uh -huh. uh, no, I, there's, there's a couple of things that I find frustrating. One, I hate arguing with positivists. <laughs> I just, so you don't, you think this is wishy-washy and you want things to be true. Okay. And then they get frustrated because I won't fight with them anymore. It's Wait, like, can you define a positivist? Positivism is a broad, well, it's a specific term, but it's used broadly by a lot of people to reflect, to, to speak of people who think that there are truths and that you can find truths and that learning and science and all that thing is about finding truth. Um, people, An objective truth that applies to everyone in all situations. That's right. I have some questions about this. We should probably do a show about this. We're rolling. Very point. This is, just keep going. Oh, we're just starting? Yeah. I mean, we're just doing it? Yeah. This is right. uh, at Tech Weekly. It's uh, November or something, <laughs> and we're here and we're talking about stuff. Excellent, excellent. And uh, I interrupted Dave as he was describing a positivist and their comment commentary. Please continue. Yeah, um, it, it essentially comes down to the idea that you can find truths, and then that's a good goal, right? And that's that's what our goals are. Um, now, I, I've just butchered a very specific philosophical position but for instance this week somebody wrote back to me and said we well, have a board about positivism what about you know the way that people build airplanes or doctors you don't want your doctor learning in some crazy rhizomatic way um which i've heard i don't know 47 times in the last year or two <laughs> Um, and the simple fact is anybody who's ever been in near a doctor realizes that they have the foggiest idea what they're doing you know, there's a baseline of language that they know the body parts and where they connect and stuff. But by and large, the science, the, the medical process is an exploratory one where instincts and feelings and guesses are, you know, really a part of the process. And certainly, Jen, um, you can speak to that. But mm -hmm. being able to say, oh, it's this, like it's a some kind of crazy science that you can just, you know, if you study hard enough, you'll know everything about medicine. It's just not like that. And I think people find it convenient to believe that the world is that way, and I understand that they would, but it isn't. And so, well, and I think um, I do my whole. We've gone through this a million times. My learn this versus my explore this. And so, learn this. I go back to my days when I was a manager, and I'd get some new person in, and I needed them to learn how to use our system, and I needed to get them up and running so yeah. they could go out and talk to a client yeah. quickly. <laughs> Yep. So there was an efficiency part of it, and I needed to take what was in my head, put it in theirs, and then whatever they did from that point on was great. And so I think, like you're saying, a lot of people get hung up on that, thinking, um, well, this isn't a very efficient way to get people up to speed and, That's right. and running with what they're supposed and, to do. And, and I understand that. I mean, it's, like, and actually, I tried to acknowledge that in the piece that I wrote for this week. There's no doubt that there's a common language that you need in any field. There's, you know, there's the telephone. It's a telephone. When you pick it up, people are going to talk in it. You need to respond to people in this way. You know, there's some basic steps here that no matter what you're doing, you need to understand the language that people have and the way it's used and that stuff. And those are the first steps on the road, right? But learning a word is a really good example. Take the word constructivism. Anybody want to give the definitive definition of constructivism? I still haven't heard it. What's that? I still haven't heard one. <laughs> well, well, that's just it, right? Okay, people okay. use the word all the time, and people talk about it and whatever. But depending on who you talk to and where you are, it comes in and sings a slightly different song. Now, when I first started out, somebody in, in this sort of field of educational technology, the, the constructivist word loomed large. And certainly, I first encountered it reading Moodle documentation because Martin Dujiamas was doing his PhD in constructivist education, hence comes Moodle, right? So I looked at that and went, oh, I just don't understand what this word means. And then I found the definition, like, oh, okay, it means that thing. And then I see it used somewhere else, and I'm like, but that's not the same as the... So then I figure one person's wrong and one person's right. And the truth is, is the word kind of lives in a bubble like this, you know? And there's kind of different usages, and it stretches, and it twists, depending on who you are. And every once in a while, somebody sits down and goes, no, this is the definition. But some other person who is just as much an expert comes down the next day and gives you an opposite one. That's the real way that words get used. So 
to start in the field of educational technology, somebody's going to have to point to the word constructivism and tell you that this is kind of one of those relevant ones you're going to get a feeling for and give you a basic definition. But the real learning, the real sort of internalization of that is much fuzzier than that. And it's far more about using it in different contexts and getting a sense of it and then starting to twist it around until it becomes yours. And that moment of becoming, where it actually becomes something that you can use and belongs to you, is kind of the thing I'm trying to describe. So it's the question so, the hmm. question that started this off was when Jen asked you, are you tired of talking about this stuff after all these years? <laughs> and this stuff being rhizomatics and, and yeah, your just approach to all this stuff. Are you sure you seem to enjoy it? Yeah, I didn't say I was. <laughs> um, I, I sometimes do get tired of having that argument with people who say, but how, how it's got to be objectivist, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Because then I'm having a religious argument with somebody. You know, they believe something. And I have no interest in dispelling people's beliefs. Um, if you want to have a discussion about something, I'm more than willing to engage in that. But a debate about beliefs there, that's, that's a completely different kind of a thing. How much has that been part of your experience? All the time you've spent discussing this and leading sessions, how much has that been the overwhelming part of the reaction? How, how, let's start in the beginning. I mean, first of all, what is your thing? Good luck defining that. And how has it evolved? And how has the response been? And what's going to happen this week? Go. Uh -huh. um, so the thing is about some philosopher guys named Deleuze and Guattari. And coming out of their work are some concepts. And the main one that I started with is the rhizome. Uh, and there are a couple of others that have come along with it that I've sort of poked in over time, particularly over the last year, to sort of round out some of the concepts. Um, and, you know, those guys are the craziest French philosophers there are. Like, they're way, way out there. Um, I'll, some of my colleagues, George Stevens, <coughs> George, um, thinks, he's, thinks they're crazy people. Um, and, and it is difficult. Why? Yes. Um, they don't particularly define things or um, it's difficult to know what they're talking about. It's difficult to understand the context they're coming from. They're post-modernists. I mean, they're post-structuralist, if you like the, that term better. Um, they don't believe in, they're not interested in, in trying to make a clear narrative. It's not something they do and they don't necessarily believe in other people's ability to do that too. So they would think of other people's stuff is an other story. So they're telling one story, and that story is useful to them. Um, and then they think of everybody else's science as just story as well, right? And that's where people start saying stuff like postmodernists call everything text. Um, in a sense, that's what it's about. So George doesn't really acknowledge them as being people in terms <laughs> of their, their having any input on the work. He doesn't mind the rhizomatic learning stuff. He actually is quite sympathetic. It's similar enough to connectivism, I think, that he's sympathetic to it. Um, but the philosophers themselves, not so much. That was a question I was going to have, and I know you and I will get bogged down here on, on yeah. words. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the knowledge piece, the learning yeah. piece, and then the instruction sure. piece. Okay. So do you view this as something that addresses how people learn? or how knowledge is exists, okay. <laughs> or how yes. a, an educator would set up an educational setting. Yes. All three of those? OK. Yeah. And could you maybe <laughs> delineate a little bit <laughs> how it's similar or different, those three things, learning, knowledge, and, and, and instruction? And what it is. I mean, we've called it rhizomatic. We said it's from these philosophers. But like, what's your point? Um, what's my point? There's a couple of points. Um, one of them is about the method of instruction impacting the way a person ends up being. So, you know, the, the idea, the concept of the nomad that I've been talking about lately is about when, when you look at the education system, what do we want to get out of it? Do we want people who simply replicate the things that they're given? So do you want them to just be able to regurgitate back the stuff that's given? If you structure a curriculum, that's definitive and defined and has set outcomes and it's tick, 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 tick. And then you bring people in and you say, okay, I want you to achieve these seven things. What you're doing is setting up a structure where success is something that's clearly identifiable and clearly attained. There is one place in the world where that's true. 
and that's in our education system. As soon as you leave the education system and you go out into the workforce or you go in a relationship or anything else we do, success is a lot fuzzier than that, right? So the argument here from an um, instructional design perspective is that if you over-design and you clearly design, you give clear goals and clear structure, what you're doing is teaching someone how to learn in an artificial environment that they're never going to replicate again. That's never going to happen to them in any other situation. So to me, that structure is problematic because what you end up doing is building robots who then have to retrain themselves when they go somewhere else how to learn, right? So if they're really good at our educational system, they're not going to be really good at, a, at the next whatever else they're doing, right? Unless they have two complete, it's, they're completely different learning styles. There's the ones we learn normally when we learn most things or the education system, which is structured and clear and coherent. So there's that point, which is about instructional design and how you go about teaching and the real impact that that has on learners. So that there's sounds that. like the second section of a Wikipedia article. What's the first paragraph of a Wikipedia <laughs> article on <under laughs> rhizomatic learning? What is rhizomatic learning? Didn't I in just a write paragraph. a blog post about this? Um, yes, it, I'd like it in audio and video, your quick answer. You're in an elevator, someone says, oh, you're, you're the rhizomatic bit. learning guy. What is rhizomatic learning? Uh, you have five floors, go. <laughs> uh, this is really good practice. I'm gonna get this all week. Um, you guys are nicer than the people are going to get me on Wednesday. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> it is, um, oh, it's tough. I, I don't know how to answer the question. I never have been able to. Jen, how um, do you answer it? Maybe you could do a better well, job. I guess I still kind of go back to my, um, is it instruction or is it a way to, to uh, is it a learning theory? Like, um, And I'm not exactly sure. And I think what you were saying depends is... Depends on what you call a learning theory. Well, um... Ding, I'm I getting guess... off this elevator and I still don't know what rhizomatic learning is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you cut me off and gave it over to Jen. We both started. <laughs> she took half my time and I took half of hers. We need another five floors. Come on. All right, we'll give you another chance, but I, I feel like you guys still need to sort out some third and fourth sections before we get back to the first. So sort out what you need to, and we'll do the elevator test again. See, I think, well, we were, we, Dave and I were, will inherently run into a roadblock because I still think learning happens in your head. <laughs> and Dave does, Dave does get squeamish when I say things like that. So well, I, Okay, let, let's, let's step back a second here. I don't think it doesn't happen in your head. <laughs> but you always the, tell me it doesn't happen. But no, but head. that's well at some point it, it's the brain and the synapses <laughs> and the things are there. So I don't I don't think that okay, the, the part where we always get mucked up is around the idea of of text, right? And I see all the texts as equivalent. I see the person talking to me and the book and all those things as all equivalent conversations. It doesn't matter how they're they're structured. And in your head, that personal space is filled with the voices of others, memory, recall, all those things. So is it happening in synapses in your brain? Well, of course it is. But it's not an alone process, which is the thing that we've sort of yeah, clashed about. We definitely I don't think it happens alone. It happens with the other voices and the memories and the recall and stuff, which I don't think of as knowledge, separate, isolated entities, but rather a bunch of narratives from a bunch of different people that you then reconnect and change your own perspectives through an interaction with all of those things. Well, I would say and, and make your own. Because and become. Become different. Yes, that's. I would agree with you. Because you and I can hear the exact same thing. You walk away with one thing, I walk away Absolutely. with another. And, and that's, that's the rhizome, right? That's exactly how it works. And when you look at a learning process, if you design it for everyone to have the same outcome, you're, you're throwing another artificial on top of that. And it's not going to happen anyway. You can force them to give you the same outcome, but that's not what's going to happen inside. They're going to switch and turn, and it's going to connect with the other stuff they know, and it's going to go off in these other directions. And for me, yes, we need to give people the established basic language that they need to do to interact in whatever it is, whether or not they're making coffee or they're building bridges. They need the language. They need the, the established shorthands that people use to remember how the best way that you know bridges normally stay up straight or any of those things they need the shorthands but the real stuff everybody's going to take that in a different way and to me that's where the rhizomatic um, idea becomes really powerful is it sort of gives license for that and it also the other part of that botanical metaphor is about creating the um, creating the context right you're creating the garden 
and with the box around it. And you're saying, okay, we're going to have a course, and it's going to be in this garden. So you can grow wherever you want in here, but we've still defined it in some way. So it's a playground in which sort of that kind of learning can happen. But Tana, so I feel like around. that's a good place to start with your elevator answer. <laughs> Because you guys, you guys called the creepy so... rootstock is a stem of a plant that sends out roots and shoots as it oh, spreads. Okay. Uh, you sound like you're ready to go. First paragraph. What is? I'm just reading off my blog post here. <laughs> <laughs> what, whatever you need to do, because I mean, you guys are so inside baseball with this stuff that yeah. when someone who hasn't been listening to you ramble for years kind of jumps in and is like, "Okay, this is really heady stuff." I just wanted to know what rhizomatic learning is. What's a rhizome? Okay, so ready? a rhizome. A rhizome is a part of a plant. It's the stem. Okay, it's something that's called a creeping rootstock. It's the mid, like um, the the aspens. There's aspens in the states that are like a million years old, and they they grow by rhizomes, right? So they spread, and the roots go down, and the shoots go up. In the aspens case, the shoot is the tree, and then the roots go down. But it's the it's the rhizome that connects it all together. The whole thing is one organism, kind of, but not really. It's spread. It's connected, but not. It's the rhizome metaphor is similar, in a sense, to the network metaphor. The difference is the network metaphor, as it's normally used, is really, really tidy. It has dots, it has points, and the lines connect them, and they're all bounded and contained and perfect. And it gives this sense that all you really need to do is have that network like that other person, and then you have it, and then you're good. The rhizome is completely, it's, um, it's personal, in a sense, you know, each one is going to be different. The directions are going to be different. You're going to take them off, and every single sort of entity is going to move in their own directions and make those connections. They're still connections, but they're not tidy, and they're not dots and points. They're way dots and lines. They're way more weird and disconnected than that. So then tying, tying it back then to a learning process, which is in your first paragraph, this is how information is shared right? Is that part of it as well? Like, I'm trying to get to the, the learning process piece. What is, what is, or process? Is that how you say it in <laughs> North? Your process. Like, what, what, is, what do you mean by that in your first paragraph? Like the learning process? Mm-hmm. It has no beginning or end like the learning process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, that particular piece, which should be, I tried to really keep this to a thousand words, which really brutalized this blog post because that's the request that I made to everybody else and didn't feel like I could break it with my own. Um, the the rhizome, as it's used as a matter, particularly the, the image in Deleuze and Guattari as it's taken up by everybody else, right, is the, the focus is on multiplicity and on everything being in the middle. So there's no outside, there's no beginning, there's no end. It's not a sort of thing where you walk in, clean slate, and start the learning process and then finish it. It's an ongoing interconnection wandering thing that keeps spreading and twisting and moving and stuff. And that's what I mean by the no beginning or end like the learning process. You think of somebody oh, okay. start, and it, yeah, it's just related to that sentence. Okay. And so I know I keep trying to pin you down on this. So okay. is this relating to the individual as their attempting to learn something or is this more talking about the whole rise of like everything like thinking of how we all interact together yeah, that was a question for me too in this metaphor where is the individual where is the learning institution or is it not oh that i think specific? It, i think it's i it's one of those things where i think over the last five years i've used it in about three different ways when i really sort of look back at the writing and stuff and it's grown far more towards the individual learner. The more that sort of I watch the way this stuff happens in classrooms and I watch the other way that other people use this kind of thing that I'm talking about, it's really about the learner, right? So the, the knowing and the developing and the connections, that thing that's happening in Jen's brain that I accept is happening in my brain, that thing is rhizomatic, right? So it's really the learner's experience. So this, how does this, um tie into our computer age that we live in now. Would this have been equally applicable 30 years ago? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, much like what George and Steven say about connectivism, I, th I would say that this is the way we've always learned. It's a, little, it's a lot easier now. 
because the stories are far easier to get in touch with. It's far easier to grab that stuff and bring it together. Um, and there's not nearly as much cachet in simply remembering what other people have thought. Right? 50, 100, 200, 500 years ago, just being able to remember what somebody else thought and say it back again was an incredibly valuable skill. So if you could remember how the people in your area have hammered a horseshoe for the last 300 years, that was super valuable information, right? So there wasn't as much call to take it further. So if you look at the, the history of the, do you know what a moldboard plow is? You know, I don't. I okay. don't know what that is. In the Jeff? third century BC, the Chinese invented oh, the moldboard plow. Third century We're going way BC. off this way. You ready? Oh, right. Okay. The moldboard plow <laughs> goes like this. It's that plow that you've seen a hundred times like in movies. I'm sorry. It goes like this. I my brain doesn't understand this. <laughs> it curls. The spike goes in, and it curls out in a way like a snow plow. Oh, I've seen that. Yes, yeah. I know what you're you've talking about. You've seen them about. in movies. Yes. You've seen yes, them in like yes, yes. like westerns and whatever okay. else. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was invented by the Chinese in the third century BC. It didn't come to Europe until the middle of the 18th century. It's the simplest invention in the whole wide world. It takes one tenth of the energy to plow a field with a moldboard plow. There was no call inside of the system, inside of Europe, to do that kind of, and you see it all the way through, the different sort of everyday tasks. That kind of creativity simply wasn't happening. People were taking what was given to them before and replicating it. Okay? So, I think that the rhizomatic growing new thing stuff was still true there, but you got so much street cred and so much value out of simply remembering <laughs> that. Sorry. What's that? I just read Peggy's comment. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, is she torturing me in the chat room? No, she said, is there another word you can substitute for rhizome when you explain it that isn't a whole story? <laughs> it's a scary <laughs> word. <laughs> Everything's a story. Sorry. <laughs> So, you know what? I think I we were we were getting somewhere, and I'm sorry I just lost it because Jeff uh, <laughs> took me. I'm so sorry. Else. Plow innovation sharing. No. Creativity. Okay, okay. I, I think I got it back. I think I got it back. Okay, so I, I keep trying to peg make the mobile day go plow. Into, I, I brought you back to the third century BC. <laughs> Come on. That, that really that turned turned the lights on in in my brain. Um, so I think you're along with it. I'm trying to make you define what this is, but I think you're also say, saying the value in what you're saying is wh where will where this will take us. If we think about learning using this metaphor, it will take us to better places than if we try to rigidly define what everyone walking in the door should know as they're walking out the door. I think that's your elevator pitch. That's perfect. That's the nomad, right? That's when you look at the, the stuff and essentially this has all been put together in the last few months in an attempt to try to explain this to people. That if we're just looking for workers and, and you know, if we're trying to train them for the factory, we're doing a fantastic job. Show up on time, do disconnected time. You've heard me say this a million times. If we're going to train somebody, if we're going to get somebody who is going to be able to innovate, create, do those kinds of things, that's not going to help. If you... If all we're teaching people, and this is, you know, it's the opening quote from the first Rhizome article that I wrote, is you cannot grow on such marrowless truths, the truths of the generation from before. If that's all we're giving our kids, and that's all we're giving inside the education system, is what's already in our own heads, it's pretty weak. You know, there's so much changing so quickly right now. There are mores and morals and that stuff, which are. Those are fine. They're all this, they've always been the same be nice to people, those kinds of things. That's not what I mean. But in terms of how we use stuff, how we put stuff together, how we innovate in the ways we think and do, and it, those things, to me, uh, you know, what we're doing now isn't enough. And if we talk, almost every educator will say that we don't know what kind of a world we're training our kids for today, what kind of world they're going to get to when they get out. If we don't, how can we possibly train them to do all the things that we know how to do now? It doesn't make so, any sense. So then, okay, I'm an educator listening to Dave in week whatever you're in, eight or whatever, and then I'm like, okay, well, how do I then take this to my classroom and make it happen? And obviously, the first thing that pops in, <laughs> let's set everybody up on Twitter, and they'll get connections. But, I mean, I'm assuming you have more ideas. 
than setting everybody up on a Twitter account, right? <laughs> no, I don't think that's not so much what I mean. And actually, it's funny. Um, uh, Lorraine Mockford posted a um, uh, Twitter form, a Google form on Twitter today talking about why you're on Twitter, or blah, 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 for some presentation she's doing. And it was the comment, the question was not should people use Twitter, but why should every educator be on Twitter? And my answer is they shouldn't. You don't need to use Twitter. It's not that. I think th that's one of the places where the network model suggests replication all the time, right? Here's the good network model. Think of the network teacher thing that Alec uses. This is what you should be. Here are all the connections you should have because this is what good people have, right? That's the danger of the network metaphor is that you then try to figure out what network is and then you try to give it to other people and then you're right back in the same place again. To me, the the Rhizome thing, and it's I've watched people almost cry in my classrooms, like literally almost fall apart when they hit this wall because I'll go, they'll say, well, what do you want us to do? And I'll say, I, I don't know. We'll have to talk about it. I mean, well, what's success look like? And these are educators, right? So they're ready to claw my eyes out. And I'll say, look, I don't even know you people. I don't know anything about you. I don't know anything about your contacts. I don't know what you guys need. I know that there are probably things I could help you with. I've had some experience. I know some stuff about some things. I have some idea things. I've, I've had a lot of failure. And I have some failure to share. You let's know, but say I don't someone, know what you guys need. Let's say someone listens to your presentation and say, man, that guy has it going on. I am a believer. Uh, we want you to come develop a program. You have carte blanche. You do whatever you want. What does it look like in terms of a course? And what is the role of the educator? Well, I mean, you can look at, I've had that here. So the course that I did here in the summer of 2010, it's essentially, I would probably tweak it a little now, but it is what I would do carte blanche, right? It's an open syllabus. So you start with um, a structure. Essentially, you build that garden space, right? You're not saying, we're going to have a course about whatever. Like, you do build a structure, because otherwise, you need to frame a discussion. To some degree, that's what the MOOCs are trying to do, right? Is frame a discussion. Not that the internet is already a discussion about everything. So we're not trying to replicate that. That's already there. We're trying to say, hey. Where's the structure and the metaphor? We've got these growing nodes and the root system underneath. What's the core structure? Where's that? Is that a fence? It's the garden. It's the garden. Yeah, it, gar it, 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 it holds the, the rhizome from spreading out. Like if you look at the nastier rhizomes, they'll spit and twist and jump over the sides and whatever. That's what you end up with something like DS-106, right? Where gone. And you can see it now where you've got people trained from DS-106 taking more traditional open courses, and they just go right off the handle, right? They're all over the place. So the more that those people get the sense that they can spread, the more you're going to need to go, no, 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 no. You know, we're trying to stay inside of this. Otherwise, we're just talk having a conversation about everything. And then at that point, that's great, but you don't need to take a course for that. There are people who will probably never need to take a course for, for something. I didn't need to take one about coffee. I just don't need to. Because I just beat my head against it until I figured it out and tried it and tried it and tried it and tried it and slowly built my own sort of rhythms for it, right? So the educating gardener says, okay, here's where we're going to be growing. And when one of the little roots starts trying to go over, you don't have to break it off, but you can bend it back into your garden. <laughs> well, that's very nice. I that's like that. That's lovely. Um, so, you know, when I teach the, the last course that I taught like this, um, I had every student build a learning network plan. And they're they're their plan was actually for how they would learn when the course was over. Because you're really not going to be able to finish all the thoughts and really bring all this stuff together while you're sitting there driving through and people are talking and there's all this stuff going on. As Jen says, it eventually comes together up here. In those moments of, call them what you will, I would call them becoming. It doesn't matter. It's that point where you kind of... Um, but odds are that six months from now, or odds learning. are that... You could call it that. You could call it that. Three Some months people from do. now, it might Some be next week. It, it, it might be in the shower. It might be in the shower. But if you build and think your way towards that future time when those things come together, then you're. It's not. Oh, what did Jimmy Bob say in that class? I remember he was telling me something. It's sort of thinking your way through this whole like through lifelong learning, right? Through thinking of the learning process not as having a beginning and an end at the start of the course, at the end, but really as part of this overgrowing sort of movement 
that you take a course to sort of you know inject some fertilizer in sorry I'm going way crazy with this metaphor now um, but it's not I'm starting to learn I'm finishing to learn it just kind of brings into the larger structure I'm going all over this metaphor you guys are you're doing this to me on see, I think the metaphor is helpful I, I feel like I would love a, a graphic and I think it's gonna have to be an animated graphic um, okay, I know who I want to design it there is one <laughs> Where is she? Did where you, is she? Did you see it? I, I did. It's it's, it's I did. great. But I it's there's no rhizome. I mean, it's great, but it doesn't. I want to see a rhizome. I want to see the garden. I want to see roots. There are roots. In the YouTube yeah. thing. Y yes, Peggy. I am saying that you can't train or teach them what they will need to know, but how they will learn it. That's exactly right. That is the sort of thing I am saying. The network metaphor isn't a should. No, it's not a should, Peggy. I agree, but it's often taken up that way. Um, and it's often sort of, here's the network that I have, and then the word slides, right? Because it goes from the network learning connectivist metaphor for some people, and then it slides straight over. George does this all the time. He talks about network as knowledge, but then his network as the people I'm connected to, and then network as, and it just kind of flips back and forth, and you're like, wait a second here. What are we talking about with your network? Anyway. That's I was just yeah. That, that's where I started with this conversation. Like, what what yeah. box? What box are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and another thought. Okay. What about the efficiency side of the equation? Um, oh, efficiency. Yeah. So as we're saying, like, so does this? How how does that play? Or how how would you make this more efficient for some? Like, are there skills that people can attain to be better? Rhizomatic learners, or I think so. I mean, again, I think of the students who've come into my face-to-face -face classes. Uh, they only look like they're going to cry the first couple of days, um, and then they start going. And it's funny because it's always the same kind of art. And then they go, "You mean I can just decide?" And I go, "Yeah, you can just decide." Now I'm going to be here, and we're going to talk about it, and I'm going to push you, and I'm going to poke you, and do all those things. I'm going to facilitate. But yeah, at the end of the day, you're going back to your life, and you might as well get something useful from this. I'm going to keep. Through the, cor through the course of this course, oh my god, I hate it when I say that. Over this time that we're together, I'm going to give you a sense of how the language for this field is used in context. And you're going to take that away with you, too. But I don't really care if you learn it. Over the planting season? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that, I, that willingness to take over, like every... Every t every student who's in, I'm not there's always two who don't two three who don't but they come up to me at some point privately and go can you just tell me what I need to do and I'll say I don't know you're going to have to figure that out right so breaking that piece of the head which they've been trained to right every friggin training thing they've ever been in you cannot talk to an instructional designer who will not say it's completely unfair for you not to tell your students what success looks like. Um, can you? Could I talk to a instructional designer who won't say that, Jen? Maybe that's unfair. Um. Well, yeah. Um. I mean, there's shades of gray, of course. Like I was just thinking, um, equating some of this to what I just went through for the past two years with my. Oh, is he cleaning off his screen, or is he getting angry with us? I can't. No, see. I was cleaning my screen. It's really. Um. Good. It, like my dissertation, it was like one giant independent study project, and the more I would seek an answer about what I should be doing, um, the less. I would get back from my advisor, so I think he was being a good rhizomatic <laughs> advisor. Lazy. Um, I got so excited my headset fell off. Um, <laughs> and I think this was by far the most challenging two years of my life. Um, yet at the same time, I think because I did have the freedom to do what I want, yet I did have someone sitting there when I would ramble on and then I would get the feedback saying, you're not making sense. <laughs> you know, Not necessarily that I was right or I was wrong. Um, try again, you know, try again, go to a different source, maybe try this. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, it took me a lot of years to be able to get to the point to be at this. I don't know how difficult this would be to have a third grader <laughs> do some of now, this. Now, the research that I've seen is that kindergartners, fantastic at it. There's a book that came out four or five years ago that tracks this kind of and actually, I think it is, it's nomads. It's Delusian nomads. In kindergartens, no problem at all. Not They're an issue. They're actually messy learners. That's right. And then we beat it out of people, 
right? If you look at it, you look and people, it's not a good citation, I guess, but this is what Ken Robertson is talking about, right? When you look at the, the ability of students as they get older to solve the creative problems, right? They're great in grade one. By the time they hit 14, they can't do it anymore, right? Now, you could say that that's biological. And one, I don't know. Maybe it is. Um, I would like to suggest that in your case, Jen, you unlearned it and relearned it. Now, I might be wrong, but then again, that's why we put theories out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, certainly, the pieces that I see, the more clearly that I try to understand this really annoying thing that I like to do to people, um, the more I'm starting to see other people saying the same thing in different ways. And there are, you say, you know, you're talking to teachers. I, I gave this, this pitch to um, Alex, um, master students, last week, two weeks ago. Um, and two or three, oh my god, this is what I've been, blah, blah. There's always a couple of people that it strikes home with, right? There's always a couple of people who say, what the hell are you talking about? This is stupid. And then there's by far the biggest chunk in the middle that says, well, I can't do everything this way. And then I say, yeah, but you can build little pieces of it in. And then that's sort of the, the middle ground that it normally ends up with because we're all we're all constrained by the power structures that we're in, by the hierarchies that we're in. It's not we're not going to change an entire educational system. Yes, Jeff. That's a segue to what I want to talk about, and and I want to kind of backtrack to uh, defining success. And to a certain extent, I think you you are <laughs> defining success. Just success is being a rhizome or learning rhizomatically. But what I wanted to ask you is, given the constraints of the system, and I'm teaching a course at a United States university right now, and I have to fill out this monstrosity of a form that has a whole bunch of, it's a, uh, you know, grid of learning outcomes and direct measures mm -hmm. and indirect measures and benchmarks. Given yeah, that, brutal. how do you suggest someone take the rhizomatic approach, still fill out that form meaningfully, and how does one deal with assessment in a rhizomatic learning, learning adventure? Um, the first thing I would say is lie. Um, <laughs> that, that'd be helpful. I had a, um, in that course, the last time I taught it here, and it's really been too long since I've done it, but I had somebody come up to me near the end of the course, and he said nice things, and, and we had a long chat about how things were structured, and he said, you know what you should do? You should offer a contract to your students, and offer students a 95, an 85, or a 75, depending on how much they're willing to work, and then allow students to kind of do some of it and pass through and fail the ones who don't do the work, and then allow your students to contract their way through the rest of it. Um, I'll never get away with doing that, but I think that's a really great idea. Um, I think that measuring people's success is not nearly as interesting as measuring how hard they're willing to work, the targets they're willing to set, and whether or not they're willing to hit them. Um, I think that that's a really interesting model. You know what? A lot of, <clears throat> I sorry. have a thought. I have a thought on mm -hmm. success and evaluation and assessment of they're learning, and again, I keep using for Dave's, I keep putting one in air quotes, but... You mean they're becoming? Um, they're becoming, yeah. Um, going back to my dissertation um, example, I was stuck for four months at the discussion part where it was very, very easy for me to report my results, to analyze them, to do the number crunching, and say, here's what I found. What I found extremely difficult was then making that mesh with those that came before me. Or, and then also thinking about, okay, what are people going to do with this after, afterwards? And making that all come together. So I think, given this metaphor of this rhizome, where you're getting your inputs from all these different places, I think it's pretty important that the person can then kind of do their lineage, where, where did they, um, not just for citation purposes, but to put their thoughts in the context of those that came before them and then those that are going to read what they're, they're doing or working on. And what, what, what's your take on that? Like, what, Would that be something that a teacher could take away? Look for that. Look for the ability to, to, to tie in to the, the greater rhizome. Wow. Because I think that's the problem. I mean, I could sit and spew stuff to you, and then it's all mm -hmm. theory or it's all whatever. Mm -hmm. But if then I can say, you know, so-and-so had a similar idea, and then they took it down this path, and then they had this critique, and then so-and-so took it and twisted it here, and then you can kind of put that all together, like what your little piece of the rhizome thought about things. 
I think that's kind of important. Hmm. I think historicity is important in all, like in all things. I mean, certainly being able to trace your own steps are really valuable. Certainly, when you need to backtrack. Um, I have a feeling that I would end up being less uh, interested in the part of what you're saying that's about citation and about acknowledging. It's not citation for the sake of like attribution necessarily, but um, like it's like I said, it's, it, that was to me the hardest part because you have to know what. Well, for, especially for a dissertation, but it's really important, I think, in any learning to to take the time to say, well, who thought about this before, and Why? What, what? Why? Because that, that that's your rhizome. That's your. your that, those are the inputs. That, your that's your learning DNA. That's your rhizome oh, DNA. Oh. Um, because otherwise, I think it's. I hate to use the word subjective because then we'll. Dance around that word for a while, but well, I don't it think just, it's any more objective to tie it to anybody else. Oh, I wouldn't. That, that's why I didn't want to use the word subjective. I know. Um, it gets back to my whole thing. I could say I wanted to send you a letter, and I'm going to wing my laptop at you. I mean, there has to be something that goes. Well, someone tried that, and it doesn't work. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. There just has to be some acknowledgement of those that came before you, not for the citation attribution piece of it, but then to move this, and now I get into the George problem, like the knowledge part of it, to move the ideas forward. That's a very evolutionist approach to knowledge. That's good. I don't agree with it. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of people would. I mean, it's you're in by far the majority of people who believe that. I just don't see it that way. I don't think I don't think of it as a progress upwards. I don't think of it as getting better in any real sense. Uh, I don't think of it as growing in a sense of getting bigger. It changes and moves, and I guess it does grow overall. There are more connections, but I, I don't think of it as a process of improvement. Um, I know we get so hung up on this idea of right or wrong. But what if someone tried stuff, and I may be having a hard time coming up with an example, and um, it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so you're plugging along doing your thing and you haven't researched that thing that happened that someone tried and so... Yeah, but I mean, I understand what you're saying. There's two edges to that sword though. I mean, it took Einstein 10 years to get his stuff published because nobody other than Max Planck understood what the hell he was talking about because a whole bunch of other people read it and went, oh, we've gone down that road before, that doesn't work. But and there's a real stifling of creativity in that kind of attachment to the past. It doesn't mean that, I mean, stories are good. The sharing of stories are good. The relation of other people's stories is good. I'm not saying that you somehow throw all that stuff out the door. The, the stories continue forward. It's just that is correct because it's attached to old things. Is something that I reject. Would you say that it's it's an optional part of rhizomatic learning? So, I mean, I'm thinking of webcasting as the metaphor. If I want to learn how to webcast, it serves me well to see other people's trial and error, oh, but it's yeah, not required. Definitely. No, no, no. But that's those are the stories that you interact with. Those are all over the place. I mean, that's that's the, the that's the community. That's the curriculum, right? That's the whole. That's the interaction with all the stuff that everybody else is doing. And what I'm saying is that. There's no difference in the value between listening to, and again, we're talking about, here's, here's a nice case. We're talking about social artists last week. Half of the people who listen to Nancy talk about social artists are going, what's that all about anyway? That's just crazy talk. It's somebody making up a new word to talk about what? Like, how do we even define that? I, I hope he wasn't listening, said some really nice things about Jeff. And I have it on recording. I played on <laughs> said my, some really nice things about Jeff play. about... When I hear the term, I think about Jeff and his ability to create space for people to think and for talk and whatever else. And people keep, well, does it have to do with learning? Well, I'm like, it has an awful lot to do with learning. If you give people a chance to connect with other people, to talk, to connect really to themselves and force that out of them, you're doing an awful lot towards that process. Now, a social artist doesn't the, interrupt, sorry. <laughs> take the term social artist, do a, is it any more valuable? if I connect it to community or practice theory, or if I connect it to Habermas, or if I connect it to Hegel. Like, I don't think it does. In terms of our ability to communicate and talk and work through the idea, I don't need to talk to, I don't need to bring it to anywhere, right? Because if I connect it back through all those patterns, then what you're doing is saying, 
what does it really mean? And then you're going back towards definitions and the connections to the rest of that. Whereas as long as the idea is live between us right now, it allows us to negotiate it in new ways and find new ideas coming out of it without being attached to a whole bunch of other stuff. See, that part rings true for me. Like, it always drives me nuts when people travel and they go and they see some bridge or something. They say, oh, this is just like the bridge wherever else. And my instinct is saying, no, it's its own bridge. <laughs> Appreciate it for its own <laughs> unique bridginess. <laughs> um, funny we chose bridges. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny what comes up. Uh, and I just wanted to say that the unfortunate thing about all those nice things you were saying to me is that just as you were getting going, fire breaks out in your building or you have a fire That's alarm. True. So I want you to know That's if at true. any point you want to continue, feel free to, to get going uh -huh. with that. Um, I did want to ask uh, about what's coming up this week uh, and how all this relates to a MOOC. You know, we had an interesting conversation with Tim Owens and Stephen Downs and others during this week's Coolcast um, talking about how messy the learning is. And Stephen kind of expressing a little bit of discomfort with how messy things had gotten early on. And Tim was saying, you know, messy is, is part of it. So how does rhizomatic learning apply to a MOOC? And what's coming up this week? How are you going to be presenting it? How are you going to be rhizomatically becoming? Uh, I noticed on? you haven't posted a cool cast this week. I did give you access to the calendar. <laughs> uh, because I was waiting to hear back from you on oh, really? timing. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, in the interest of making learning a little bit less messy, I'll answer your second question first. Um, we have created a calendar for live events. Um, so, three of the four things I'll be a doing this week are calendar is so restrictive, though. Yeah, like, what if, yeah. what if I just want to be one day? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. That's okay. That's okay. You, it's okay. You can have fun at my expense. I'm just preparing okay. for this week. It's all good. <laughs> I'm going to get a lot of that this week. I uh, just hope that Chris Lott doesn't come in anywhere because it's going to tear me apart. Um, there are about four people who I have. You know, I figure I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with most people, but Chris just, <laughs> oh, man. Have you ever talked to Chris? No. Oh, and it doesn't man. sound like I want to. Oh, he's so smart. Oh, I'm going to tweet him um, now. Make yeah, sure to you stop go ahead. today's presentation. That's right. <laughs> Um, so there are four events right now. There are three of them posted for next week up there. One of them is incorrect. I'm going to have to change the time on it because it puts it right in the middle of Remembrance Day here, um, which I probably shouldn't do. Which is Pepper Day here. Which is not, which is not, um, it's not the time that we celebrate Remembrance Day in this time zone, but it would be in two time zones away, which is not terrifyingly respectful. So I'm going to change it. Um, so I'm going to do a formal session on Tuesday. I'm essentially going to do the same session I did in Alex class, except I'm going to try to take all the feedback that I've gotten since then and make that presentation better. And then I'm going to run the live presentation. Every second or third slide is going to be a live slide for people to populate. We'll see where the conversation goes from there. Um, I'm going on with Julia and Cogdog and Dr. Garcia and a bunch of other scary people um, for a um, DLTL... DLTL? DTLT. DTLT session on Wednesday. I have no idea what they have in mind. It'll probably be much like this. Um, and, uh, he grimaced when he said that. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, there'll be the Thursday session is the one that Jeff hates um, with Stephen and George. And I don't know what they want to do. Um, I've hosted the last couple, so I don't know what happens when I'm not hosting. So we'll see. I have a feeling Stephen and George will argue about objectivism. Um, and I do not hate them. I think they're great. I just think it would be nice to have better audio. I think it would be nice to see your video um, and bring more people into the conversation, which kind of happened. I mean, at least you had Nancy in this week. That was nice. We actually brought Howard Reingold in, too. Yeah, and Howard Reingold. Speaking. And Irene tried, and like you know, I, I just thought like it would have been nice. Jeffrey had tweeted a lot and been very active that week, yeah, and he, he was didn't busy in the chat in. room. But you we invited tried him. to get him in. Great, we did. Um, but, but again, look at the echo problems we had, even with the people we had there. Like it's just yep. <laughs> haven't haven't heard any echo problems today. <laughs> <laughs> He's caffeinated and oh, got a good night's sleep. Um, really so yeah, um, so that's those are the sessions we're going to do this week, and um, I'm going to try to get people to work on Julia's challenge. I've asked, I've challenged people to try to look at the stuff that they've done. I think the interesting um, one of the things that comes up from what Jen said earlier about her um, her prof. I wonder if 
I've seen this in Bonnie's PhD program too. If those same people feel the same way about non super special PhD learners and whether or not they're willing to do that with younger people or non PhD people. So my challenge is for people to take something small that they do and try to think about it this way. How well, would you go in without a yes. curriculum and come out with one? Because he, I, I, you're right. Because I think he trusted that I was not going to, and I <laughs> this will be a fun one to throw out there. I was not going to BS the system. Like I could have made this whole process go a lot faster <laughs> if I hadn't challenged myself at points to question what I was saying, to dig mm -hmm. a little deeper in the lit review, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that part I think makes me a little nervous. I think um, a lazy learner, <laughs> someone who just wants to get through and get this over with, could take a whole lot of shortcuts. Um, and you have to, I, I don't know, when you've got a whole bunch of people running around doing different things, how you're going to um, help make sure that the people are giving it their all. And maybe I guess your point would be who cares if they give it their all. But I would love to. I, I really like that contract idea. I thought it was a really nice one. Um, because people do come in with different needs and different amounts of time they can devote to it and whatever else. And, you know, but a rhizome grade. doesn't make a contract for itself. You know, it's a little bit contrary, I think, to, it's to what you're saying. It certainly is. There's, there's so much of this. The, the term that Deleuze would use is re-territorialization. There's so much of this where as soon as you step back into the system, you get locked right back into where you started again. And it's a constant trade-off. The most, the, the, By far the most comments I've gotten in the last week have been for people saying, but uh, that's not rhizomatic. I mean, Absolutely. I feel like if the contract says, I'm going to pursue my learning passions, okay. But if it's learning outcome centered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the power in this situation, the hierarchy present there is the fact that I have to give a numbered grade back to the university. So I have to give them a number grade. So given that, how do we negotiate it? Um, if I didn't have to, if I had a pass fail, no problem. Do what you like. Don't suck. You know, and I have no problem pulling people aside in a pass fail and going, you're going to fail. Well, it doesn't kind of a, a portfolio come into the picture i mean i don't know what you're thinking in terms of a contract well, like i, mean, I say write three reflections me, and it's a person well uh, i'll show you the I, i've posted in the chat room in this um discussion probably 14 times in the last two years but it the the major chunk of the work that you have to do in the course is that future learning plan it's that how how is this going to blend into the other things i'm going to do in the future how am i going to pull this together i'm less interested in the pieces that you've put together to sort of help you bridge your understanding now um, than I am in how you're thinking about how this connect, connects with the other stuff that you're doing that you're interested in. Again, this is an adult class, so there's a whole other structure around that that's going to be different if they're 12. But they were, they had that, they had to do, uh, they had to model that inside of the classroom. They had to do a present, like a, they had to teach for like a half an hour. Um, they had to do some of those stuff. There was peer evaluation and all the rest of that stuff. Um, I even evaluated their ability to be able to pull together 18 people talking in a Google Doc into some kind of reasonable feedback for people. Um, so there are points in places where there are some of those literacies that I evaluated, but mostly I evaluated them for effort. The people who didn't try got bad grades. The people who did try, I mean, and again, that course is a bit weird. Um, it, it's got a lot of crazy things in it. So. Uh, it would change. Like if I was, I keep thinking about what I would do if I was to teach academic writing this way, which is another thing I've taught a lot. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I hope because I, I mean, what the approach I've taken is, you know, I kind of tell students in most of my courses: pursue your learning passions, document your learning. Yeah. Which, you know, yeah. okay, what do we do? <laughs> and so I wind up giving, oh, well, for example, you could do this or this or yeah. this. Um, and, and that what do you do is that to me that's the learned response, right? That's what the system trains people into doing is tell me what to do, I will do it. And I don't think you ever get anybody invested in tell me what to do and I will do it. I don't think that's an investment. They can get invested in the outcome of the grade, but not in the content. What does document you know? your learning mean, Jeff? It hey, means I don't get the answer. Show me show me what you got. Show me what you've learned. Uh, and it can take whatever form you want. What is Dave doing? I don't know. Why is he going like a mustache thing? Um, yeah, and it's you know it's not clearly defined. It doesn't mean okay. I want you to create blo three blog posts about this and whatever else. It means choose your your style 
and show me something. <laughs> Become. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, on that note, perhaps we should uh, head into the home stretch here because I've got a class coming up in, oh my goodness, a little over an hour. And I did have some planning I had to do, but I'm just going to tell them that today, class, we're going to become. <laughs> we're going to become. Yes. And you th then they can tell you how they've become. Dave, we seem to have lost your audio. It's a rhizomatic learning approach that means I don't have to prepare for my classes. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> Love it. Big fan. Le learn. <laughs> learn. Learn. That's learn. a big step that he's actually saying the word learn, though. Isn't that yeah. a big step for you to say that? I think so. I don't think we would have been here 18 months ago. I mean, he here's the thing. I'm not an academic. I do not have the time to... And this this is a really great experience because you call me in all kinds of places where I go, yeah, it doesn't quite work out, does it? I don't claim to have this stuff nailed at all. I do know that... I, I, I'll say believe. I believe that there are at least five or ten people who have found in the stuff that in this stuff something that's been really useful for their the way that they do things for that it seems like a good adventure it also gives me a sense like it's forced me to be a lot less lazy about my own approaches it's forced me to go okay well why am i really doing this so it's been really good for my teaching too other than that i mean i'm kind of that lazy academic person you were talking about earlier you know I, it's, it's great, too, because Deleuze will say that, or would have said, because he's dead now, <laughs> um, that, you know, you look at A Thousand Plateaus, it's not a book you can read from cover to cover. It's a book that you dip into. And he will say, you know, take the pieces that work for you. And, and for me, it, it'd be weird to take something from a Deleuzean context and not feel the same way about other people. If there's one or two bits of this that work, you know, I'm, I'm somebody in the, in the Twitters who's saying, I really wish I liked that point. Which I think is kind of a nice thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are bits and pieces, I think, here for a lot of people. And that, that makes it worthwhile. But there's no way that, um, that it's going to work for everybody. See, I think, and I'm sorry, I, I will get off my soapbox on this point. But um, see, I think it is important, though, to, con to have a conversation to, for you to be able to say to George, why is he doing that? Do I have, like, a funny thing on my face? Um, I think it's important for you to be able to say to George, okay, I've read your stuff, here's where my stuff meshes and where it doesn't, which gets back to what I was saying before. I think, I know you wrote something about this once too, that whole threat, or did we do this when <laughs> one person stole your rhizome, rhizome metaphor? And then we got into the discussion of did they steal your idea. But anyway, they, they didn't, and I wasn't caring about it as being an attribution thing, but I was upset that they didn't compare and contrast your ideas to what they were presenting. But I don't know. Ah, it's Movember. Wow, that's all you got oh. going so far? Sorry, pal. That doesn't grow very fast. Wow. Oh, that's what he's talking gotta about. He's that looking at himself. On your upper lip, man. Uh, and I, I thought he was looking at me. He's looking I at himself. I think this is the first time I will have said this in six years. I think you're being overly humble, Dave. Uh, I think it's more than bits and pieces of useful stuff. I, I think there's something to the metaphor. I think in tri you know, so much of what we ed tech ed people consume ourselves with these days is how does learning happen and has it changed in this era and stuff. And I think, I think rhizomatic learning has always happened. I, I think the technology has um, supports it really well. And I think there are parts of the network model that don't that aren't neat. And, and I like the messiness of the rhizome. Um, I just want to see more pictures. Mm. And I think for me, for outcomes, when I look at the whole process, and I feel like I should say something summative now, um, the, that guy who was using the straight plow, the little spiky one, for like 1,200 years and wasn't innovating or being creative, he also wasn't being critical of his government. He also wasn't in a position to be able to make other kinds of decisions. And right now, we have a requirement from our citizenry to be able to go, wow, you're just marketing to me. Or, wow, my government's really silly, and this is why I think it is. And I think that we need an education system where the outcome of the education system are people who, that the whole reason we're teaching is to have that 
critical ability to have that ability to create that ability to lead change whatever and to me our education system is the opposite right now and you know i i feel like that's a almost a, a such a huge component of of your point that i would also when when you start answering what is what rhizomatic learning i would keep those separate you know when i've when i've heard you talk about this a lot of times you start with that or you say you know we're be training them for the 18th century or whatever and that's all mm -hmm. very true i feel like they need to be led there i need to i i think like laying the groundwork of this is what rhizomatic learning and this is how i think people learn and this is how it's happening in the 21st century and as a result i think this is important because of all these other things just some feedback like i just did this time more so yes <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Jen. You got a parting shot? Um, no, actually, and 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 in all fairness to Dave, he really did a pretty good job with his elevator pitch on his blog. Jeff, did you read it? Uh, I was skimming it as we were speaking, but I haven't really digested it. It's it's. But I will. It's much closer to an elevator pitch than we've probably giving him the credit. Yeah, for. And, and the truth is, is that in in being an elevator pitch, I think it takes away from some of the some of the the good parts of it I think it, it in trying to the the definition thing as Jen mentions in the chat room is something that you're gonna have a hard time making me do because it's to me I, I do try I want the story I don't want the definition the definition locks it down too much it's too confined it's too positivist it's too modernist that's um, where the picture helps that's what I, I'm telling you man if I could hire Julia tomorrow see I think it helps with context but because okay, whatever we, we keep going back and forth, but <laughs> <laughs> on, that, on that note. But um, but I think that that you'll face that this week. Everyone's going to say, "Oh, so what you're saying is like what George says, except yours grows in a garden." <laughs> 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 oh, you're saying what so and so says, except yours does this. Um, so I need to uh, wrap this up. But Dave, do we want to? Do you want to do a cool cast? Do you want to be sure? Cool? Um, do and do you have a time that works. Uh, time is my killer. Let's let's Sweet. let's sort this out another time. Okay, uh, very soon. Go teach your class. Okay, as always, a pleasure. Ta ta for now. I hope I'm back next week. That's my goal. Us too. Bye guys. Be back in time. Good okay. luck with your presentation this Thank week. Thank you. Jen. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Have a great Bye. week. Thanks everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.